Good afternoon everyone. God is good. God is good all the time. Do you have your Bibles with you? Do you have your Bibles with you? Are you ready to study? All right, thank you. Let me just give a disclaimer that uh, I'm not a pastor. <laughs> All right, all right, on a light note, of course. Uh, I wish to invite all of you to our study this afternoon. And now we are almost winding up uh, the subject of the spirit of prophecy. And uh, tomorrow, Uh, we are almost winding up. Tomorrow will be... Actually, this is the last presentation. I've just noticed that. I think I had prepared more than enough. Eh? So tomorrow afternoon, we will not have this session. And so this will be the final presentation on the subject of the spirit of prophecy and I hope your faith has been strengthened in the gift of prophecy that God, out of his love for his church, has given to the people of God the testimony of Jesus. In the course of these discussions, we have had a moment where we discussed Ellen White and uh, John the Baptist. We also had a session where yesterday we talked about Bible prophets in general and Ellen White. And today we want to study John the Revelator and how he wrote the book of Revelation and Ellen White and how the book The Great Controversy was written. And we will learn that there is a striking similarity between the experience of John, the Revelator, and the composition of the book of Revelation, and Ellen White, and the book, The Great Controversy. The first part of this presentation will deal with John, the Revelator, and we will study the details of John, the Revelator, and then the second part of this presentation, we will go now to Ellen White. Before we begin, let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of the testimony of Jesus. As we open your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit that moved the prophets will once again open our understanding to the deep things of God. I pray that you may lead us, be with my words and my lips, that I will speak with the clarity. By faith we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The text that we have been studying all week long is, maybe let me see the class that I have, which was the text we have been studying the whole week. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Thank you. Let's read it one more time. By now, maybe you can say it from heart. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, it says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, who are they, which keep the commandments of God and have the word of Jesus Christ, the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so we have been trying to understand that passage, and today we want to end our study series. And so the end-time remnant church of God the Bible says they have or they possess the testimony of Jesus. And by now we have already learned that the testimony of Jesus is not what we testify of Jesus. It is the testimony of Jesus. It is his testimony. It is Jesus testifying of himself. And we, we asked Jesus, who, how then does Jesus testify of himself. That's just to recap, let's read once again. John chapter 5 verse 39. John chapter 5 verse 39. 
and we understand in the immediate context when the Bible talks about the scriptures, it is not talking about the entire Bible as we have it today. In the immediate context, in the time of Jesus, the scriptures were primarily the Old Testament. And therefore, we read it with that understanding in mind. And those who wrote the Old Testament were the prophets, all the way from Moses to Malachi. Then Jesus says, John 5:39, such the scriptures, the Old Testament, the writings of the prophets, he says, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and these are they which do what of me? Testify of me. So according to Jesus, who bore the testimony of Jesus? It is the prophets. Are you following me? And therefore, all the prophets had the testimony of Jesus. Jesus testifies of himself through the ministry of the prophets. And therefore, if the remnant church of God in Revelation has the testimony of Jesus, that church must have a prophet through whom God testifies of himself. And we had already identified the remnant church of God and came to the conclusion that actually Ellen White was God's prophet and this church being the remnant of Revelation 12, 17. And so we do not have apology now when we quote the writings of Ellen White. Are you with me? Now what we want to do in the next few minutes is now study the experience of John the Revelator and how he composed the book of Revelation, and then we will close with Ellen White and how she composed the book, The Great Controversy. Two books with uh, two prophetic books. Let's start with John. Detail number one. Did John the Revelator have the testimony of Jesus? Notice Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show his servant things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant who? John. Verse 2 will say, and John bore witness to the word of God and to the word of Jesus Christ to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. So detail number one, that John the Revelator had the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the question will be, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Notice Revelation chapter 19 verse 10. We had read this previ text previously. Revelation 19 verse 10. It says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. That is, John fell at the feet of the angel. And he said, But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the what? The testimony of Jesus. Then it says, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is what? Is the spirit of prophecy. And so now we learn that John the Revelator had the testimony of Jesus, which now is called the spirit of prophecy. Did you know that the book of Revelation is the spirit of prophecy? It is the testimony of Jesus. You see, most Adventists, when you say the spirit of prophecy, what comes to mind are the writings of Ellen White. Mm -mm. All the writings and the messages of the prophets are the spirit of prophecy. They are the testimony of Jesus. And in this context, the book of Revelation is also a testimony of Jesus or the spirit of prophecy. So did John have the testimony of Jesus? Absolutely. When God gave John the testimony of Jesus, to whom was those messages directed to? Who was supposed to be given those testimonies? Notice Revelation chapter 22, verse number 16. Revelation 22, verse number 16. It says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things where? In the churches, so question, when John the Revelator received the spirit of prophecy or the testimony of Jesus, to whom was he supposed to give the messages to? To the churches, it says. Are you saying that was testimonies for the church? Are you with me? 
that the testimony or the messages of John were not given to the Romans or the Babylonians. He was supposed to testify of these things in the church. Are you with me? Interesting detail. Let's continue. Now, what was the visionary experience of John, the revelator? That is to say, when he was in vision, what experience did he have while in vision? Now, notice Revelation chapter 1, verse number 17, on the visionary experience of John. It says, Revelation 1, verse 17. And when I saw him, when he saw the angel, it says, I fell at his feet as what? As dead, it says, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. Sorry, that is Jesus. I am the first and the last. So the Bible tells us here that one of the visionary experiences of John is that while he was in vision, he fell down as though he was dead. Interesting detail. By the way, you'll notice that when God speaks to his prophets, Romans chapter 2, uh, sorry, Numbers 12 verse 6 says, when there is a prophet amongst you, he says, I, the Lord, shall reveal myself to him through visions and dreams. I will, I will make myself known to him. Which means, if God calls you to be a prophet and he gives you a vision or a dream, he will make himself clearly known to you that he is calling you to be a prophet. That is to say, if you have a dream and then you come asking, what do you think that dream means? That itself is evidence that you are not a prophet. <laughs> Did you catch what I said? Absolutely. For example, even Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. But he could not interpret the dream. God did not make himself known that he is calling Nebuchadnezzar to be a prophet. And that is why he had to go to God's prophet for the interpretation. Are you getting what I'm saying? But the Bible tells us that while in vision, John the Revelator fell down as though he was dead. Did you know that prophets sometimes speak and write things they do not fully understand. But they have to say it because God has said it. And sometimes prophets need help to understand what they are seeing in vision. And you will notice that the prophets of God always had an attending angel who helps them to interpret some of the things that they see in vision. For example, notice then, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Revelation chapter 2 verse 11 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the testimony was given through the Spirit of God. But the Spirit was also working through another agency. Revelation 22 verse 16. Revelation 22 verse 16 it says, I, Jesus, I have sent my who? My angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Do you notice the first text says it is the spirit testifying in the churches. But verse 16 says that it is the angel testifying of these things. In other words, John the Revelator had an attending angel who helps him in understanding the things that he's seeing in vision. Are you getting what I'm saying? And so the testimony came from the Father, through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, through the attending angel to the prophet, and then to the church. Are you with me? Even Daniel did not understand everything he was seeing in vision. And he required the agency of an angel to help him understand. Notice Daniel chapter 7 verse 16. Daniel chapter 7 verse 16. It says, I came near to one of those who stood by me and asked the truth of all these things. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Do you notice even Daniel had an attending angel to help him understand and interpret the things that he's seeing in vision? Are you with me? Another detail. I want you to notice that while John was in vision, he also had a voice 
that directed him and commanded him to write down the things that he was seeing in vision. Notice this detail. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. It says, I was in the spirit. That is another way of saying he was in vision. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. But now notice the last part of the verse. It says, and what thou seest, what do you do? Write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. And so while he was in vision, he did not only see many things, but he was also commanded in vision, and he had a voice commanding, write down in a book everything that you are seeing in vision. Interesting detail. Did you know that in the visions of John, the revelator, he had the opportunity to speak to Jesus himself. Hmm? Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. After he had heard a voice speaking to him, notice what he did. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands stood one like the who? Like the Son of Man, clothed with garment down to the feet and guarded about the chest with a golden band. And so the Bible tells us here that in one of those visions of John, he had the privilege to speak to Jesus himself, the resurrected Jesus. Now, here is the question. God reveals so many things to John the Revelator. And then he commands him to write them in a book. Now question, which language did John speak? Help me out. Are there people here? Did you understand the question? No, one day I asked you whether this is the only brain you depend on in exams. <laughs> Which language did he speak? Greek, eh? All right. And now God reveals to him so many things, some of the things of heaven. And then God tells him, write them down. Question, how many think his mother tongue is so eloquent and rich that it can accurately represent the things in heaven? When the Bible says the things God has prepared to her, for us, no heart has even perceived. And now you are required to write them down in your mother tongue. How many think his language was good enough to represent the things of heaven? Absolutely not. And when you read the book of Revelation, you will detect that actually John also is struggling to find the right words to express what he's seeing because of the inadequacy of human language. Let's just read but one. Revelation chapter 15 verse 2. It says, And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. <clears throat> now let me ask, when you go to heaven, how many think you will find a sea that is mingled with fire? Of course not. Whatever John is seeing is glorious and he's trying to find the right words to express what he's seeing and then he say, I saw something as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. In other words, human language falls short to express the things of heaven. Are you getting what I'm saying? And he does not find the best words to express the things that he's seeing in vision. In other words, human language is inadequate to express the things of heaven. Notice how he described the holy city, Jerusalem. Revelation 21, verse 10 and 11. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now notice now he's trying to describe the holy city. Verse 11. Having the glory of God. Mm, how can you describe the glory of God? 
and her light was like a stone most precious, even like jasper, clear as crystal. Do you notice that John the Revelator is struggling to find the right words to express the glory of the holy city? It was like some stone most precious, even like jasper, clear as crystal. In other words, he falls short because of the inadequacy of human language to describe the things of heaven. Are you with me, God's people? Now the question is, did everything that John write was original with him? Is originality one of the qualifications to be a prophet? Or a prophet can also borrow statements from other authors and don't give credit. And it is not plagiarism. <laughs> what are some of the literary sources that John used? Which sources or literature did he also depend on while writing the book of Revelation? Notice, for example, you will notice one of his sources, he depended on inspired sources. And so he will quote sources that are inspired. For example, Revelation 14 verse 7, he will say, Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Then he will say, and worship him that made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. Do you notice he is borrowing the language from Moses? When Moses says, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the fountains of waters and all that is in them is. In other words, one of his sources are previous inspired prophets. And do you notice when he borrows that line, he does not give credit to Moses. Are you with me? Number two, some of the material that he will also bring in the book of Revelation is original material that no other writer has written about. Follow me closely. Number one, some of the material in the book of Revelation he is quoting from inspired sources. Are you with me? Then some of the material in Revelation is also original with him that no other writer has written about. Are you with me? For example, when he will be writing about, I saw a harlot woman sitting on a scarlet beast. You can read from Genesis to Revelation. No other writer has described such a thing. And so some of the material in the book of Revelation are unique with John the Revelator. You know, some people will ask, you read something in Ellen White and you say, where is that in the Bible? I am saying some of the materials of the prophets are also original with the prophet that no other writer has written. Are you with me? And then you will notice that John the Revelator also borrowed expressions from sources that are not inspired. Are you with me? For example, the book of Enoch, which is a not an inspired book, has this text. And of course, the book of Enoch existed uh, before the book of Revelation. It says, and after that, I saw thousands of thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. I saw a multitude beyond number and reckoning, or a great multitude that no man could number, who stood before the Lord of Spirits. Does that sound familiar? Of course. John the Revelator borrows those language and expressions while he's describing the people of God standing on the sea of glass. I saw a great multitude that no man could number. In other words, prophets can borrow expressions even from sources that are not inspired without giving credit where they got that expression from. Are you with me? And we covered this yesterday. And so somebody will have asked the question, if they do not give credit, is that not unethical and guilty of plagiarism? What do you think? Because you will notice John the Revelator and Matthew and Mark and Luke, they were contemporaries. They lived during the same time period. And therefore, they should be applying the same ethics in literature. And when Matthew is writing, you will notice that Matthew will be giving credit for his sources. 
For example, let's read this one, Matthew chapter 2, verse 17. Matthew will say, Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there, was there a voice heard, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Question. When Matthew says, In Ramah there was a voice heard and lamentation, where did he get those expressions from? He's telling us, those are not my words. Who made those statements? Jeremiah did. And so Matthew seems to be giving credit or citation of where he's getting his expression from. Let's read one more. Notice Matthew chapter 3 verse 3. Matthew once again will say, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So when Matthew says that the voice of one is crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Where did he get those statements from? Hello? From where? From Isaiah. And now he's giving citation that these words are not original with me. It is Isaiah who made those statements. And therefore, are you saying that Matthew was more ethical and John the Revelator unethical? Are you with me? And of course, for those who were there yesterday, we saw that God's prophets could borrow statements from uninspired sources without giving credit. Did Solomon compose all the Proverbs you read? Hmm? No. Listen, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 9. It says, And moreover, because the preacher was wise, that is Solomon, he still taught people knowledge, Ye, he gave good heed, but now notice, and sought out and set in order many proverbs. Eh. Did Solomon compose all the proverbs? No. He went out reading and he got some nice proverbs people had made. And then he set them in order. And then you call it the word of God. And he does not give credit who made which proverb. Did you catch that? Yesterday we saw Paul quoting the poets. In him we live and move and have our being even as some of your poets have said. Without giving credit which poet had made that statement. Because his intention is not to quote the poet as an authority, but because that expression is convenient to convey the truth that God wants communicated. Are you with me? Lastly, did you know that the devil attempted to take the life of John, the revelator? And the devil attempted to take the life of John before he wrote the book of Revelation. It appears as though the devil did not want the prophet to write that book. What do you think? And we are told that John was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil. And the Lord preserved the life of his faithful servant, even as he preserved the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. In other words, that the devil wanted to wipe out John. But the, we are told here that God preserved the life of John so that John could write the book of Revelation. Are you with me? Now with those details, let's turn to part B of this presentation and talk about Ellen White and the book, The Great Controversy. Question number one, did she have the testimony of Jesus? Of course, we have covered this. Revelation 12, 17 says, And the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of our seed. We identified ourselves, the church, as the remnant church of God. 
that we keep the commandment of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Did she have the testimony of Jesus? Of course, she, call, she even calls the books the testimonies. Listen to what she writes. The testimonies are of the Spirit of God or of the devil, as the Lord has manifested himself through the spirit of prophecy, past, present, and future have passed before me. Did she have the testimony of Jesus? Absolutely. The spirit of prophecy. By the way, do you notice, she says, there are only two options. That these testimonies are either of God or of the devil. Are you with me? And if the devil can inspire somebody to write a book like Steps to Christ, then there must be good devils. Are you with me? It is have to make up your mind. They are either of God or of who? The devil. Now a question. If she had the testimony of Jesus, to whom was that testimony supposed to be given to? Speak out. The church. Did you know that you cannot go to a crusade and start quoting testimonies to the church volume 3, page why? Or at your workplace and people ask you, why do you Seventh Adventists don't do this and this? Then you say, councils on food and diet page. Mm -mm. You do not do that. Why? Listen to what she says in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 669. I stated that some had taken an unwise course when they had talked their faith to unbelievers and the proof had been asked for. There are people who are talking their faith with other people and those people asked for proof for why they believe what they believe. What did they do? They had read from my writings instead of going to the Bible for the proof. It was shown me that this cause was inconsistent and will prejudice unbelievers against the truth. The testimonies can have no weight with those who know nothing of their spirit. They should never be referred to in such cases. Did you catch that statement? In other words, she's saying the testimonies are for the what? For the church. You could not go to a Roman pagan soldier and you tell them Matthew chapter. Are you with me? It was given for the church. It is testimony for the church. And so the next time somebody asks you at workplace or wherever, why do you Seventh-day Adventists do this and don't do this? You eat this, you don't eat this. You do not say, Ellen White says in this book page, mm -mm. It is testimonies for there. But when you come here, I can now say, selected messages, page. Are you following me? And that is why, did you know that the gift of prophecy or the spirit of prophecy was given for believers? And the Bible confirms that. Notice 1 Corinthians 14 verse 22. It says, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22. Therefore, tongues, the gift of speaking in tongues, are for a sign not to those who believe, but to what? Unbelievers. Why did God give the gift of speaking in tongues? It was not for believers. It was for who? Unbelievers. So that they will wonder, how are these disciples who are Jewish, how are they able to speak our language without going to class? And therefore, the gift of speaking in tongues was not given for believers, but the text says for unbelievers. How about the spirit of prophecy? But now notice the last part. But prophesying, or the gift of prophecy, or spirit of prophecy, is not for unbelievers, but for those who do what? Believe, it says. And that is why you do not quote Ellen White to unbelievers. Prophesying are not for unbelievers, but for those who have already done what? Believed. 
Now, what was the visionary experience of Ellen White? Or what was her experience while she was in vision? Notice this. And you know, her visions were not private. She had visions in public where there were believers and unbelievers. There were even skeptics present. That is why Numbers 12 says, If there be a prophet amongst you, I, the Lord, will make it known. And so you do not come with a private dream you had and you say, God spoke to me. Mm -mm. God must also make it clear to the people. Those visions were public. Are you with me? And then it says like this, manuscript 16. It says, they thought that I was what? That one of her visionary experiences, while in vision, she fell down as though dead. For hours without breath, even the medics could confirm she is not breathing. And she says, they thought I was dead. And there they watched and cried and prayed so long. But to me, it was heaven. It was life. Did you catch that statement? That, that, like John, one of our visionary experiences, he fell down as though dead. Mm. Did she need an angel to help her to understand some of the things she's seeing in, in, in the visions? That must be a new doctrine, isn't it? No prophet has ever experienced that. Of course not. Notice early writings, page 38, it says... I asked my accompanying angel the meaning of what I had and what the four angels were about to do. Do you remember Daniel who also had to ask the angel the meaning of what he has seen? In other words, prophet, prophets needed the agency of the angels to help them interpret what the things they are seeing in vision. And so likewise, as John and Daniel and other prophets, she also had an attending angel. When John was in vision, he had a voice commanding him to do what? To do what? To write in a book the things that he was seeing. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1, page 73. It reads, While in vision... I was commanded by an angel to do what? To write the vision. I obeyed and wrote readily. Mm. That in one of her visionary experiences, as John the Revelator, she had a voice commanding her, write in a book the things that you see in vision. Are you following me, God's people? Did she have the opportunity to speak to Jesus himself in vision? Early writings, page 54. She says, I saw a throne, and on it saw, sat the Father and the Son. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired his lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold. For a cloud of glorious light covered him. Then she says, I asked Jesus if his father had a form like himself. And he said he had. But I could not behold it. For he said, if you should once behold the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. Question, did she have the opportunity to speak to Jesus himself? Hmm. As John, when he heard the voice, he turned to see the voice that was speaking to him, and he beheld one like the Son of Man. Mm. Now, John spoke Greek, but Ellen White was American, speaking English. Are you with me? And God showed her all these visions and everything, and she was commanded, write! Now, how many think English is a very rich language that it can exp express the things of heaven? It's a powerful language, isn't it? Hmm. 
Then she began to write. And now listen to what she says. I'll write things. Language is altogether too feeble to attempt a description of heaven. As the scene arises before me, I am lost in amazement, carried away with the surpassing splendor and excellent glory. I lay down the pen and exclaim, Oh, what love! What wondrous love! Then she says, The most exalted language fails to describe the glory of heaven or the much less depths of a Savior's love. Did you catch that? That even English is not good enough to describe the things of heaven and the depths of God's love for humanity. And therefore, she also experiences inadequacy and limitation of human language to describe the things of heaven. As John will be saying, I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, struggling to describe the things of heaven. Now, we covered this yesterday. Did she borrow statements from sources that are not inspired? Absolutely. Of course, number one, she borrowed sources from inspired writers. She quotes scripture. Those are inspired sources. But apart from depending on inspired sources, we saw that she will also have material that is original with her. And then she will also quote sources that are not inspired and sometimes without giving credit. Are you with me? For example, she will describe Jesus in the holy place, in the most holy, having the garments of a high priest, interceding for us. And then she will say, then I saw Jesus remove his priestly garments and then put on the garments of the king coming the second time in the clouds of heaven as king of kings and lord of lords. And then the critics will say, where in the Bible does it say Jesus changed clothes? <laughs> but think about it. What is Jesus doing right now? He's the high priest. Are you with me? How is the high priest gabbed? We have studied the sanctuary here. He has the priestly garments. Are you with me? But how will be Jesus be coming the second time? Mm, as king of kings and lord of lords. Don't you think it is obvious he must have changed the clothes? <laughs> Are you with me or not? And so we saw yesterday for the interest of time, we quoted this statement on the forepage of the great controversy where she admits and says there are times when she have quoted a historian and no citation has been given. And we qualified this that even Bible prophets could quote other sources without giving credit. Now let's close this. Is it possible that the devil attempted to take the life of Ellen White before he could write, she could write the book, The Great Controversy. We have seen the devil wanted to kill John and he was thrown in boiling oil and then God sent his angels and saved his servant so that now he will write the book of Revelation. How about Ellen White and The Great Controversy? Mm. Listen to this story. She writes, After I came out of vision, the afflicted, here the context, they had attended a funeral. Many people attended a funeral. And then in that funeral, she had a vision. Again, she never used to have those visions in private, in secrecy. And then come and say, God told me. Are you with me? Now, this was at the funeral. After I came out of vision, the afflicted friends and a portion of the congregation bore the body to its resting place, and a great solemnity rested upon those who remained. Two days after this occurrence, we took the cars to Fremont to uh, Jackson, Michigan. So the funeral is ended. Two days later, 
Now they are traveling back to Jackson, Michigan. They are going to Michigan. Let's follow. While on the cars, we arranged our plans for writing and publishing the book called the what? Now follow the story. They have come from a funeral. Now they are traveling to Michigan. As they are traveling, they are laying down plans. When we get there, how she will sit down and write the book, The Great Controversy. Maybe the devil is listening as they are planning. Then it says, we are writing the book, The Great Controversy, immediately on our return home. I was then as well as usual. She was in perfect health. Then it continues. On the arrival of the train at Jackson, Michigan, we went to Brother Palmas. We had been in the house but a short while when as I was conversing with Sister Palmer, my tongue refused to utter a word, what I wished to say, and seemed largely and large and numb. A strange and cold sensation struck my heart passed over my head and down my right side. For a time, I was insensible, but I was aroused by the voice of earnest prayer. I tried to use my left limbs, but they were perfectly useless. For a short time, I did not expect, finish it for me, to leave. That as they were in the house of Palmer, talking, Suddenly, she had a stroke, and her limbs were paralyzed, and her speech gone. And for a moment, she thought she was not going to leave. Now, there are many causes for stroke. Don't you agree? What could be the explanation of this stroke? Let's read on. It was my third shock of paralysis. Was it the first time? No, it was the third time. And although within 50 miles of home, I did not expect to see my children again, I called to mind the triumphant season I had enjoyed at Groove and thought it was my last testimony and felt reconciled to die. Was it the first time? No. So the question would be, was this stroke just one of many others? Is that a fair question? It's a fair question. Was this a natural stroke like the previous ones? Later on, when they were in general conference, meeting, session, Listen to this statement she made at the general conference session. Quote, At the time of the conference at Battle Creek in June 1858, this is later on, Sister Hutchins, who now sleeps in Jesus, was sorely afflicted with sickness. And we all felt that she should go down to the grave unless the Lord should raise her up. That sister was very sick and people felt that she should just sleep and not be in pain. Then it continues. While praying for her, the power of God rested upon us all. And as it came upon me, I was taken off where? In vision. Do you notice once again, those visions were not private in secrecy. Are you following me? Let's continue. Now she goes in vision during a general conference session. It says, In that vision, it was shown that in the sudden attack at Jackson, Michigan, do you remember it? That Satan intended to take my life in order to hinder the work I was about to write. But the angels of God were sent to my rescue. (laughs) Did you catch that statement? Was it a natural stroke? No. 
But Satan attempted to take her life so that she will not pen the book, The Great Controversy. Just like the devil wanted to take the life of John so that he will not pen the book of Revelation. And God sent the angels to save his servant John. Did you know that of all the books Ellen White has written, she says, if there is one book that should be printed and circulated above all other books, guess it is which book? The Great Controversy. The Great Controversy. Don't you think it is time you read that book and share with a friend? Conclusion of the matter. How did God's people throughout history treat the prophets? We covered this yesterday. What did they do? Mm. We are happy with Jeremiah, isn't it? No. Ah, John the Baptist, wonderful message. No. No. In fact, they said John the Baptist has a demon. And so you expect God's people will be loving Ellen White, isn't it? Wonderful testimonies, right? No. They will find every excuse to undermine the prophets. Those are just counsels. After all, we are the PhDs. Isn't it? They killed the prophets, persecuted them. And so it is even today. I want to end by addressing one criticism to the Seventh-day Adventist church. And one of the criticisms you hear out there, people say, USDS, you believe in Ellen White. Have you ever heard that one? Now, how do you respond to that? You say, no, she's just a good uh, commentator. Isn't it? Now, listen. We do not believe in Ellen White. Did you catch that? Somebody's wondering, what are you saying? And you have been teaching about the testimonies. Listen. First Chronicles 2020 20 puts it this way. Listen. It says, Believe in God that you may be established. Believe his prophets that you may prosper. Did you cut that verse? It says, Believe in God and then believe his prophets. We do not believe in the prophet. We believe the prophet. Did you catch that? We don't believe in Moses. But we believe it. When he says God created in six days, we believe it. Did you catch that? When they say USDS, you believe in Ellen White. Then you tell them, and you, you believe in Ezekiel. They say, no, 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 we don't believe in Ezekiel. We believe in God. Then say, yes, the same is true with us. We believe in God, but we believe the prophet. Are you with me? Do you know why we are not prospering? Do you know why? It is in the text. Believe in God that you may be established Believe his prophets that you may prosper. Do you want to prosper? I have a solution for you. Believe God's prophets. Did you catch that? You want excellence in education? 
There is the book education. Student teachers. How about marriage and family life? Adventist home. Healthful living. Councils on food and diet. Bible prophecy, the great controversy. Every aspect of our Christian experience if we will believe God's prophets, I suggest to you that we will excel in everything that we do. Your family will excel. Your child will excel. I want to speak to the young people. I recommend to you the testimony of Jesus. The manual for excellence. Believe his prophets that you may prosper. And may God bless you in Jesus' name. Shall we end with a word of prayer? Thank you, Heavenly Father. What a wondrous love you have given to us. That in these last days we are not left without help. That through the agency of the Holy Spirit, you have given us the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus. That we may prosper. Father Lord, I pray that you may help our unbelief. That we will study and order our lives in harmony with the words of your prophets. Whether it is matters of our homes, letters to young lovers, healthful living, how to run our institutions of higher learning. May we not, Lord, be as the ancient of Israel who stoned the prophets. Thank you for you have been speaking to us through your word. And we glorify your name in Jesus' name. Amen.